in order to understand the world and its evolution. It has always been considered necessary to have an understanding of man himself. It is admitted far and wide that in bygone ages, when the life of matter was not the only subject of consideration, but when spiritual existence was also taken into account, man was regarded as a microcosm, a little world. This was understood as meaning that man is that man in his nature, in his activity, and in his whole attitude to the world, is a concentration of all the laws governing the cosmos, of all its activities, and of its whole being. During those ages it was strongly felt that a true understanding of the world could only be based upon an understanding of man. If, however, we desire to be truly without prejudice, we are immediately confronted by a difficulty. When a man tries to acquire self-knowledge, which alone can give a true knowledge of man, he is immediately confronted by the greatest of all riddles, and after some time spent in self-observation, obliged to admit that his own being, as it appears in the world which his senses reveal as encompassing him, does not appear in its fullness even to his own soul, to himself. He must admit that a part of his being is concealed. The ordinary physical development remains unaware of its existence. Thus, the man who desires a real knowledge of the world is confronted with the task of first developing his own being and of finding his true being through self-knowledge. A simple reflection will prove that a man's true being, his inner activity, his personality, his individuality, cannot be present in the world, which according to the evidence of his senses is all around him. For the moment he passes through the gates of death, his corpse as such becomes subject to the laws of the world by which he was surrounded, and which alone was perceptible to his senses. The physically dead man is then given over to those laws of nature active in the visible world. What we know as the organism of man then ceases to exist, and in a certain length of time, depending on circumstances, it is entirely destroyed. So that those laws we designate as the laws of nature, and of which we learn by means of the external observation of the senses, are only adapted for the destruction of the human organism and not for its construction. We must therefore seek for these laws, for that activity which in the earthly life, from birth to death, indeed from conception to death, battle against the laws of decay. Every moment of our life we are occupied through our inner human nature in fighting against death. When we look around us, in that part of the world of sense which is alone comprehensible to man, the mineral, lifeless world, we find it governed by the forces which mean death to man. It is a delusion on the part of the modern scientist to believe that he can grasp the nature of plants by means of the laws governing the outer world of sense. He will never be able to do so. It will never be possible to comprehend the plants and though we may cherish the possibility as an ideal, we can never investigate the plants, still less the animals and physical man, by means of the laws active around us in the external sense world. We, as earth beings, between conception and death, are in our actual inner condition at war with the laws of nature. If we really wish to rise to human self-knowledge, we must investigate that activity in the human being which wars against death. Indeed, if we wish thoroughly to investigate the nature of man, which investigation is to be the subject of these lectures, it is necessary to show how man, through his evolution on earth, finally reaches the point when his inner activities, as far as this earth life is concerned, are put an end to by death. Death gains the victory over the hidden battling forces. 
This is just mentioned to show those present the trend of these lectures, for the truth of what I am stating will only be proved in the course of several lectures. We may, therefore, begin by indicating, by means of a plain, unprejudiced consideration of the human being, where we must look for the real nature of man, his personality, his individuality. These must be sought not in the realm of the nature forces, but outside them. There is, however, another signpost, for I prefer at first only to give indications, and that is that while we live as earth men, we live for the moment. If we are sufficiently unprejudiced, it is easy to see all that is implied in this assertion. When we see, when we hear, when we perceive by means of our senses, we are living for the moment. Neither the past nor the future can make any impression on our eyes or ears or on any other of our senses. We live for the moment and consequently in space. What would become of man, however, if he were only devoted to the moment, only devoted to space? External observation of nature furnishes us with ample proof that man cannot remain man in the full sense of the word if he only lives for the moment and in space. The external history of the illness of many a man is proof of this. There are well investigated cases of persons who at a given moment of their lives lost all recollection of what had taken place before and lived only for the moment. During that time they did the most foolish things. In contradiction to the life they had hitherto led, they may perhaps have purchased a railway ticket, traveled to a certain station, and done whatever was necessary at the moment in a reasonable way. In fact, they may have acted in a way cleverer and more skillful than before. They went to their midday meal at the proper hour and did everything connected with their daily life at the right time. When they reached the last station for which their ticket was available, they may have taken another, which perhaps did not correspond with the first journey. In this way they may have wandered about for years, until at last they reached some place in which they did not know where they were. Everything up to the time of taking the first ticket or even leaving home is completely blotted out of their consciousness. Their memory only extends to the intervening time. This puts their soul life and all their human life on earth into a state of chaos. They do not feel connected with their whole being as they used to, as they used to do. Formerly they always lived for the moment and could always direct themselves aright in space. Now they have lost the inner sense of time. They have lost their memory. The moment a man loses the inner sense of time, the real inner connection with the past, as regards this earth life, his life becomes chaos. Merely living in space does not suffice to make his whole being healthy. In other words, a man in his senses always lives for the moment, and though in certain cases of illness he may sever his life from space and from the moment, yet at such times he is not a human being in the full sense of the words. Our attention here, directed to something in man which is withdrawn from space and belongs only to time, so that we may say that while the experience in space is one with the experience in time, which must ever be present, for memory must bring the past into the present if a man's whole being is to be complete. Man's presence in time is an unavoidable necessity, something which he cannot be without. Yet, as regards the past, time is never with us at the moment. In order to experience time, a man must bring it into the present. There must, therefore, be in man forces for the preservation of the past, forces which do not come from space, and which cannot, therefore, be regarded as laws of nature active in space, for they are outside space. These are the signposts pointing to the fact that if in seeking knowledge of the universe we take man as the central point of study and thus start from a knowledge of self, 
It is above all necessary to look into oneself for what constitutes man a being in the life of space, that life which is the only one of which the senses can speak. A man must therefore appeal to forces of knowledge in himself not connected with the senses or with his perception in space if he wishes to realize his own being. Particularly at the present time in man's evolution, when natural science in so very significant a way points to the laws of space, the real being of man, for reasons which will be made clear in the course of these lectures, is on the whole lost to human observation. It is therefore specially necessary at the present time to indicate those inner experiences which, as has been shown, lead man out of space into time and carry his bygone experiences into the immediate present. Taking this as a point of departure, a man can, as we shall see, enter the spiritual world. In all ages, the knowledge which led over from the sensible into the supersensible has been known as the knowledge gained by initiation, the knowledge of that which makes the human being the actual ego being, and which is the active part of the personality, of the individuality. This initiation knowledge, insofar as it is accessible to man today, is what I have to speak of in these lectures. In the light of this knowledge, the evolution of the world and of man shall be considered here in the past, present, and future. I must, in the first place, describe how this initiation knowledge can now be acquired. It differs very considerably from the initiation knowledge of the past. Even the way such subjects are discussed today is different. By the initiation knowledge of bygone times, a few teachers of mankind work their way through to a vision of the supersensible in world and man. Those pupils who had received in their feeling a pure human impression of what existed in such teaching concerning the supersensible attach themselves to those teachers. They did not accept compulsorily that which was conveyed to them. Rather, was it that the personality of the teachers produced a sense of authority? Throughout the whole evolution of humanity, down to the present time, we are always told that the individual pupil had to bow to the authority of a teacher, a guru. In this, as in many other points to be discussed in the course of these lectures, initiation knowledge cannot now follow the same path as it did in the past. The guru never hinted at the means by which he himself attained his own knowledge and there was never at any time a question of making known to the public the methods by which higher knowledge can be acquired. This was solely communicated in the mystery schools, which in those olden times were the high schools on the way to the supersensible. That method would now no longer be possible in face of the consciousness which humanity has at the present historical time generally acquired. Anyone speaking of supersensible knowledge at the present day is naturally obliged to begin by stating the means by which such knowledge can be gained. It then, of course, rests with each one to decide how he himself will arrange his life with regard to the exercises for body, soul, and spirit, by means of which it is possible to develop in the human being those forces which extend beyond the laws of nature and by which it is possible at the present time to perceive the real being of the world as well as the real being of man. These lectures will therefore follow the obvious course in that I will begin by giving a few indications of the way in which present-day man can acquire knowledge of the supersensible. We must begin with man himself and the position he has assumed in life, on earth, in space, and in the present moment. Man in soul and body, as an earth being, I say this deliberately, is threefold, 
He is composed of a thinking, a feeling, and a willing nature. The human being's share in earth life includes all that lies in the sphere of thinking, feeling, and willing. Let us first consider the most important section of man by which he plays his part in earth life, and this undoubtedly is his life of thought. For this thinking nature in man gives him that complete clearness of comprehension as regards the world, which as earth man he requires. Compared with enlightened thought, feeling is but dim and indefinite, and those profound depths in man's nature from which the will wells up are at present quite unfathomable as far as ordinary observation is concerned. Just consider how little will we make use of in the ordinary world, in our everyday experience. For instance, suppose you decide to move a chair from one place to another. First you form the thought of moving it. Then in your mind you see the act accomplished. The concept once formed then passes into the blood and muscles by some means of which you are completely ignorant. What takes place in your blood, muscles and nerves when you go across the room, lift the chair and put it elsewhere, that too is part of the concept which you imagined. But the actual inner activity at work within your skin is a process of which you yourself are completely unconscious. In your thought you could only foresee the result. The process of willing is therefore that of which we are least conscious in our waking activity. Of man's activity during sleep we shall speak later. In his waking activity the will is quite in the dark. In fact we know just as little of the translation of thought into will as in everyday life we know of what happens to us between falling asleep and waking. Even while awake we are asleep to the inner nature of our will. Our concepts, our thinking alone, brings clearness to man's earth life. Feeling occupies a position midway between willing and thinking. Just as our dreams stand forth as indefinite, chaotic concepts, as a sort of half-sleep between sleeping and waking, so does our life of feeling lie between willing and thinking, and is in fact a waking dream condition of the soul. Yet man's concepts, his thoughts, are what we must regard as his clearest light. But how does man's thinking run its course in ordinary earth life? In our whole human earth life it plays an absolutely passive part. Self-observation can alone render us thoroughly honest as to this. From waking to falling asleep man gives himself up to the outer world, he allows the impressions of his senses to have the mastery, and with these are connected our concepts. If we turn away from the sense impressions, or if they leave us, our concepts still remain within the soul. As time goes on they change into memories. An honest self-examination, however, would compel us to admit that in the concepts which are the result of our ordinary life, there is absolutely nothing that does not come from the outer world, from the observation of our senses. If we investigate the contents of our soul in a conscientious and unprejudiced way, we shall find that in some way or other they are all the result of external impressions. In this respect, those mystics who do not probe into the very depths of their nature, I am only now referring to such, are subject to illusion. They believe that by a more or less dim inner training they can attain inner insight concerning that higher divine nature which is the very foundation of the world. These half or even quarter mystics often tell of an inner soul light kindled within them or of what they may have perceived spiritually. A man who is really honest and conscientious over his self-examination will not fail to observe how many mystic visions can be simply traced back to external sense impressions, which in the course of time have undergone transformation. The following case may perhaps seem paradoxical. A mystic who has reached the age of forty 
believing he has had a direct imaginative, visionary impression of, uh, let us take a concrete example, say, the mystery of Golgotha, in which he saw this with inner spiritual vision, will feel very greatly uplifted inwardly. But a really good psychologist may investigate the earlier life of the mystic and find that as a boy of ten years old, when accompanying his father on a visit, he saw a little picture. This picture, which referred to the mystery of Golgotha, made but little impression on his soul at the time, but it remained, and in an altered form sank into the subconscious depths of his soul, and at the age of forty it arose as a great mystical vision. This must be emphasized most strongly to anyone who, today, ventures in any sense to speak publicly of the paths to supersensible knowledge. (coughs) For if he regards these paths as of easy ascent, he will, as a rule, only be able to speak of them in a dilettante way. One who wishes to speak with authority of mystical supersensible paths must make himself acquainted to some extent with all that can lead to error in this domain. He must know, and know accurately, that ordinary self-knowledge contains for the most part nothing but transformed external impressions, and that true self-knowledge must be sought today through inner development by drawing up forces from the soul which were previously not there. At this stage, one must consider the passive nature of ordinary thought. It creates impressions in obedience to the senses. The earlier impressions arise in one's thoughts sooner, the later ones arise later. What is more on the surface in one's thought is uppermost and what is deeper is below. Thus, as far as man's ordinary concepts are concerned, not only in ordinary life but also in science, He only follows in a passive way the events that take place in the outer world. Our science has indeed progressed so far as to consider the way things now take place in the external world without the smallest thought being given to them as the ideal. It considers it ideal to keep all thinking as much as possible in abeyance when pursuing its methods of research. In its own domain this is quite right. By these means it has made the greatest possible progress, but it has gone further and further away from the true being of man. For the first step to those means of supersensible knowledge, which as regards the inner soul forces may be called meditation, concentration and so forth, the very first essential is to find a bridge leading from purely passive thinking to inner activity of thought. The following is a purely elementary description of the first step to be taken. Instead of being stirred from without by a given concept, we must select one that we ourselves have altogether drawn from our inner being and hold that as the center of our consciousness. It does not in the least signify whether this concept is a correct one or not. The point is that it should be actively drawn from the inner being of the soul. For this reason it is well not to take a concept which may have been stored in our memory, for many indefinite impressions are attached to all our memory concepts. When we ourselves draw something from our memory, we cannot be sure as to how much passive thought is connected with it. We cannot be sure whether we are really carrying out our meditation with real inner activity. There are three possibilities. The first is to proceed quite independently. In this case we may take an easy concept, as simple as possible, which we are aware of having made then and there, and which is in no way connected with any memory. For instance, we might take an apparent paradox, which would drive us to say, If I ever thought such a thing, I must have been out of my mind, a concept that deviates, and consciously so, from all we have received passively. We must, however, be quite sure of the activity, the inner activity, by means of which the meditation arose. A second method consists in going to someone who has had experience in this domain 
and asking him to give us a meditation. This method might make us afraid of becoming dependent on that person. But if we realize that from the moment we are given the meditation, each step must be taken independently by means of our own inner activity, that we have only been given the opportunity of receiving something new and that we must grasp it with inner activity for the very reason that it comes from another, if we are fully conscious of this, we need not be afraid of becoming dependent. But we must be careful that our actions in this respect are guided by this consciousness. The third possibility is to seek a teacher in what I might call an invisible way. You take a book which you know you have never had in your hands before, open it at random, and read a sentence. In this way you can be quite sure of getting a perfectly new sentence which you must proceed to master by your own inner activity. You make this sentence the subject of your meditation, or else perhaps you may take a figure or diagram found in like manner, which you can be quite sure you have not seen before. That is the third method. <clears throat> By means of this, one cr can create a teacher for oneself out of nothingness. The circumstance of having come upon the book and read it and allowing the sentence or figure or diagram to come to one is one's teacher. Thus it really is possible at the present time to find a way into the higher worlds, along which, and this is essential for the man of today, we can be sure that no other power can wrongfully interfere in the activity of thought we exercise therein. In the course of these lectures, we shall see that what man needs, particularly if he wishes to evolve into a higher world, is a proper regard and value of his free and independent will. <clears throat> if we do not prize our free will, how are we to develop inner activity at all. The moment a man is dependent on another, his will is fettered. The whole point of a meditation today is that it should be accomplished by our own inner activity, by using our will in thinking. That will which is so little valued in passive external thinking, particularly by the science of today. In this way we develop active inner thinking. The rapidity of a man's development depends entirely upon the nature of the man himself. One man may attain it in three weeks if he keeps on diligently working at his exercises, preferably using the same ones. Another may take five years, another seven years, another nineteen years, and so on. The essential thing is never to let one's energy diminish, but constantly to seek the transition to this activity of thought. There does come a time when we really do acquire a different sort of thinking, which does not, as does ordinary thinking, consist in a series of passive pictures, but is quite active inwardly, and is a force of which we know, while experiencing it clearly, that it is similar to that used when we raise our arm or point our finger. We become acquainted with a kind of thinking in which we feel we are the force-bearers of our own individual human being, a kind of thinking which I am not speaking figuratively but uttering a concrete and actual truth, a thinking which is capable of coming into collision with and of striking us with the force of a blow. We know that cannot happen with ordinary thinking. If I run against a wall and give myself a knock, my physical body is hurt, my sense of touch receives a jar. My sense of touch exists through the circumstance that my physical body offers resistance today. I can strike out. The ordinary passive thinking does not strike out. It only pictures the state of being struck. It is no reality. It is but imagery. The thinking attained in the manner described is reality. It is something in which we live. It knocks up against us as the finger strikes against the wall. And just as we know that one cannot press one's finger through all parts of the wall, so do we also know that we cannot with this real thinking pierce through in every direction. 
the first step is, through our own activity, to transform our thinking into a psychic organ of touch, so that we feel just as much part of that as we usually do when we grasp or touch something. We become aware that we are part of a living being, not as it is the case in ordinary thinking which only presents images. We are living in something real, in a psychic organ of touch, and this we ourselves as human beings then wholly become. That is the first step to be taken. We must change our mode of thought so as to feel, quote, I myself have now become all thinker, close quote. This kind of thinking is not like physical touch. <clears throat> our arms our arms are part of ourselves, and when we are grown up, our arms are fully grown too. But this thinking that has become active is more like a snail. It can put out its feelers and draw them in again. We then form part of a very strong and forceful being, yet that being is inwardly mobile. It can go forward or draw back and is in constant inner activity. We can extend our lengthened organs of touch into the spiritual world, as we shall presently hear. We can feel around with them or draw them back when we are spiritually hurt. This is something which must be taken seriously by one who desires to penetrate to the true being of man, the transformation of man into a completely different being. For we cannot contemplate man as he really is unless we realize the possibility of perceiving in man himself something very different from what he presents to the view of the earthly senses. What is thus developed through the activity of thought is the first supersensible member of man. It will be described later. First, then, we have the ordinary physical body of man which can be perceived by the ordinary sense organs and which offers resistance if touched with the ordinary organs of touch. We then come to the first supersensible part of man, which may be called the etheric body, or, if you prefer it, body of formative forces. The expression does not signify, but we must use a terminology. I shall therefore in future call it the etheric body or body of formative forces. Here we have the first supersensible principle of man, which is actually just as perceptible to the higher sense of touch into which the thinking can be transmuted as the physical things outside are to the physical touch. <clears throat> thinking is transmuted into supersensible touch, and this latter is perceptible to the etheric body of man, and can in a higher sense be actually seen by it. This is, so to speak, the first real step forward into the spiritual world. The very way in which I have endeavored to present the experiences of the thinker when he passes into the inner force reality will have drawn your attention to the very small importance which, compared with that experience, need be attached to remarks made inferring that a person who enters the spiritual world by such means probably gives way to some fancy or other, or is subject to self-suggestion. A man who, having had such an experience, wishes to speak of the higher worlds, will immediately be met by such remarks. It will be said that he is only reproducing the pictures called forth by his own auto-suggestion. People may quote the fact that if a man has constantly drunk lemonade, the taste of it is so strongly present in his mouth that he may feel the so-called physiological phenomenon of his saliva tasting like lemonade. Self-suggestions as powerful as this are known to exist. All this is certainly true, and a man who enters the spiritual world by means of one of the three correct methods described here should make himself thoroughly acquainted with the results attained by psychology through its scientific methods. I would, however, suggest to a person who implies that one may drink lemonade by self-suggestion that although that may be possible, I should like to meet the person whose thirst was quenched by this imaginary self-suggested lemonade. Here comes, in the, here comes in the difference between a passive picture 
and something actually experienced. Through his whole association with the spiritual world, a man can, by active transmutation of his thinking, enter that world in a purely spiritual condition, so that his thinking is transmuted into a sense of touch. Of course, this does not mean that we touch a table or a chair, but we learn to touch in the spiritual world. We enter into real relation with it. By means of this activity, we learn to distinguish between a mystical, fanciful auto-suggestion and experience of spiritual reality. Such objections are only raised because people have not yet fully have not yet really investigated the methods described by the modern science of initiation, and only judge of these from outside, having perhaps only heard them mentioned or learned of them in a quite external, superficial way. Anyone entering the spiritual world by the methods described above, having attained the power of touch, will know how to distinguish whether he merely imagined his experiences while exercising active thought, or whether he actually perceived by means of it. Even in ordinary life we can distinguish the difference between awkwardly burning our fingers in a flame and picturing the event afterward. There is a lively difference. The the one experience really hurts while the other does not. In a higher domain the same difference exists between what we may imagine concerning the higher worlds and what is really experienced therein. Now, the first thing a man experiences in this way is true self-knowledge. For just as in life a momentary cognition will reveal the table and the chair standing before me, the Penmanmar lecture hall, in all its beauty, with the clock that does not go, just as all this stands before us in our external dream life and is for the moment perceptible to us, so to that thinking that has really become active in the world of time, the world of time of our own human self is present to us. Our past experiences, which can usually only be called into our consciousness in picture form, then present themselves as a tableau in which what is long since past lives in the present. Just as persons who have had a shock through being in danger of death by drowning sometimes see, as admitted even by materialistically minded men, a psychic picture of their life on earth, such a picture appears to the soul of one who has rendered his thinking active. It begins from the time in his earth life when he first began to think and continues to the present time. Time becomes space. That which was the past becomes the present. A picture is before him, the characteristic of which is, I shall speak of this again in tomorrow's lecture, that because it resembles a picture, he still has a sort of sensation of space, but this is only a feeling for the space thus experienced. Let me read that again. But this is only a feeling, for the space thus experienced lacks the third dimension. He no longer experiences a third dimension, only space and two dimensions, so that he perceives pictorially. That is the reason I call this cognition imaginative cognition, for it works as does painting in two dimensions only. It is a pictorial cognition working in two dimensions. You may wonder, if I stand there and experience two dimensions, what happens if I go on and once more experience in three dimensions? There is no difference between them. The experience of the third dimension falls away altogether. I shall later on have occasion to speak of the fact that in our age, because we are no longer conscious of these things, people try to find the fourth dimension, thinking thereby to enter the realm of the spiritual. The truth is that when we advance from the physical into the spiritual, instead of discovering a fourth dimension, the third falls away. We must accustom ourselves to recognize the reality in this domain, even as we have learned to recognize it in other domains. People once believed the earth to be flat, and they thought that if they went on and on a point would be reached where the world ended, 
and just as it was considered to be a great advance when it was ascertained that if a man went far enough he returned to his starting point, so will it represent an advance in the inner comprehension of the world when it becomes known that on entering the spiritual world we do not go from the first, second and third dimension into the fourth, but turn back to the second, and indeed, as we shall see, even return to the first. That is a truth. According to the external conception of the world, prevalent in our time, which reckons numerically in a quite external way, as there is a first, second, and third dimension, there must necessarily be a fourth, but this is not the case here. One turns back to the second dimension, and the third disappears. The student then gains a true imaginative cognition, which at first appears in his own self as a life tableau, so that he surveys, at the present moment, as it were, in mighty pictures, all that he went through inwardly during his earth life. There is something else which differs still more from mere memory. These memory pictures are of such a nature that we feel that what dwells in the memory chiefly comes from without from the ideas we formed about the world, from the joy and sorrow we felt, from what we did to others and how they behaved to us. These are the principal impressions dwelling in the ordinary memory of ideas. For example, we may relive in our ordinary memory a meeting we had with someone when we were ten years old. We can recollect how he came to us and what he did to us, whether good or bad, and so on. But in the life tableau, we relive our first view of the man and what we did to gain his love, what our impressions were. Thus, what we experience in this way has developed within us in an outgoing direction, whilst our ordinary memory reproduces what is developed within and comes from without. It may therefore be said that in the life tableau, there dwells something which is, as it were, an experience in the immediate present, in which one thing does not occur after another in sequence, as in memory, but where events stand side by side in two-dimensional space. It is quite easy to distinguish this life tableau from the mere memory picture. Now what is thereby attained is the increased inner activity, the active experiencing of one's own personality to a greater extent. That is the principal feature. We live more intensely. We develop with more intensity the forces radiating from our own personality. Having experienced this, we must now progress to a further stage, and this no one really likes to do. To this stage belongs what we might call the strongest possible inner self-denial. For what we experience in this tableau, when the earth life comes before the soul, gives us subjectively, even as regards what was painful in the past, a feeling of happiness. An immensely strong feeling of happiness is connected with this imaginative cognition. From this subjective feeling of happiness, have proceeded all those religious ideals and descriptions such, for instance, as Mahometanism. I'm going to re- spell that M-A-H-O-M-E-T-A-N-I-S-M. Mahometanism, which describes a life beyond that of earth in radiant pictures. These all proceed from the experience in the imagination of this feeling of happiness. When the next step is to be taken, this feeling of happiness must at first be forgotten. It now becomes necessary, after having arbitrarily called forth the tableau of our own life by means of meditation and concentration of thought in the manner described, through the thinking having been made active, it now becomes necessary to drive that out of our consciousness with all the strength at our command. In ordinary life, it may be quite easy to drive all the content out of our consciousness. Those persons who go up for examinations complain greatly of everything being driven out of their consciousness which ought to be there. In fact, ordinary sleep consists really in nothing but 
the driving of everyday matter from our consciousness. This takes place unconsciously, however, for a person going up for examination certainly does not consciously drive out of his mind all the knowledge he has acquired. It occurs subconsciously. He does it because of his weakness, because of lack of power, and not being able to call on this power at the moment. This, however, is the very power that must be strengthened, and this elimination of the content of our consciousness must be accomplished before the next step can be taken in supersensible cognition. It may indeed easily occur that, having concentrated all his psychic forces on such a self-chosen content, and because of the feeling of happiness connected with the tableau, a man may be inclined to be satisfied with that and wish to retain it. But he must be strong enough, having acquired what he has striven for with such enhanced strength, to blot it all out again. This is more difficult to do than the blotting things out of one's ordinary consciousness to which I just referred. As you know, when the sense impressions are gradually withdrawn, when, by darkening the room, we prevent a person from seeing, and by keeping everything still, we prevent him from hearing. When all the daily impressions are suppressed, he falls asleep. This emptied consciousness, which usually brings about sleep, must be brought about at will. But having blotted out the whole contents of his consciousness and all the impressions deliberately made therein, the student must be awake. And this is the significant point. He must only be awake for the purpose of exercising the inner activity. He must not be awake to outer impressions or to any experiences of his own producing. That is then the establishment of the emptied consciousness, but it must be fully experienced as such. Then, having thus blotted out his consciousness, what, through his enhanced forces, he was able to bring about within it, when his consciousness is completely emptied, it does not remain empty. Then comes the second stage of cognition, which, in contradiction to the imaginative cognition, may be called the inspirational cognition. Having by means of such preparations acquired the emptied consciousness, it now becomes possible for the spiritual to appear before the soul just as clearly as the visible world to the eyes or the audible world to the ears. It is now no longer our own experience that comes before us, but the spiritual world, which penetrates us and presents itself to us. If we are so strong that we are able to blot out of our consciousness not only separate parts of the life tableau, parts that we may have particularly worked upon, but the whole life tableau at once, so that we can call it up or dismiss it at will, If having had the life tableau, we can replace it with the emptied consciousness while wide awake, the first thing that will then enter will be the pre-earthly life the student brought with him before descending into an earthly body through conception. The first true supersensible experience that comes after establishing the emptied consciousness is that of seeing one's own pre-earthly life. From that moment one knows of the immortality of man from a side which is no longer emphasized today. Today people only talk about immortality, but they do not learn the reality of it simply by saying immortality is the refutation of death. That certainly is as true as the other side, of which we shall have much to say. But what we first learn to know through the cognition acquired by the methods I have merely outlined is not immortality the negation of death, but birthlessness, the negation of birth. That is just as important to man as immortality. Only when it is understood that eternity has two sides, birthlessness as well as immortality, shall we be able once again to penetrate the permanent by means of cognition, to penetrate the truly eternal in man. Modern languages still contain the word immortality, but the word birthlessness, which the ancient languages possessed, has been forgotten. 
one side of eternity, unbornness, has been forgotten first. Now in our materialistic age, man's knowledge is faced with the tragic moment when immortality too may be forgotten. The tragic time when there is no longer any desire on the part of the purely materialistic conception of the world to know anything of the spiritual which lives in man. Today I have only been able to give in the merest outline the very first steps that lead into the spiritual worlds. In the next few days we shall have to go further into the subject and then to go on to what can be learned by these methods concerning man and the world, past, present and future.